in this last part of the discussion of the modern versions of the mind-body problem, I'm going to try and make some very general conclusions, but really I'm just going to give you my own view about what, what this field is trying to tell us. So when I read about the mind-brain problem, other people's books and papers, I find myself agreeing with everything I read, even though they can be completely opposite viewpoints. So I think philosophers, and I guess partly because they're writing in uh, English usually, and I'm English, and I find it easy to, to read, and they, they tend to write very well, and they can be very convincing. I mean, they can be a bit, you know, lengthy as well. But after looking at all of these positions again, and I looked at them once upon a time back in my uh, undergraduate day, and um, I, I still feel like my, my general bias is to agree mostly with the eliminative materialism view. I'm not saying this is the right view and you shouldn't, you know, just write write about this in your exams because because I think it. Um, this is just my biases. And the reason I think this view holds some promise is that um, I think the history of science is, is just so compelling. The purpose of CHIP course, I think, is to look at the history of psychology and psychological sciences and neuroscience and try and question it to ask what brought us to this point? What concepts have we got rid of? What concepts can, are we looking to explain? So we are part of a, a long and long and long history of psychology. So in summary, I think about all of the modern positions on the mind-body problem. Everyone basically agrees that the brain is important for creating the mind. And so it seems to me that advances in brain science are going to be the most important for advancing our understanding about the mind. And that's why I find the eliminative materialism view particularly convincing. So in the rest of this short summary, I'm going to put the mind-body problem in the context of the history of neuroscience, a very, very, very quick history of neuroscience. So neuroscience has, just like psychology, a long past but a short history. Um, the Greeks, of course, started everything, as, as we're led to believe. Um, they thought the brain was quite important, uh, but I think the Greek view is that there are animal spirits, you know, the, the things that made people alive and animated were in the nerves and the ventricles of the brain. So they thought it was sort of a fluid. You know, there were fluids running through the nerves and the spinal cord and the spinal column and, and inside the brain. A thousand years later, um, the Middle Ages, Islamic world, made various progress in the description of um, the brain and the body and medical conditions, neuropsychology and neuroanatomy. And then the Renaissance, the period that we've dealt with in this course a fair bit, um, 1500 to 1800, there was a lot, an awful lot of detailed neuroanatomy in, in that period, partly, interestingly, um, because of the plague, the Great Plague in London in 1600s. Um, there were a lot of specimens to, uh, to do experiments on. And then Descartes with the, the mind-brain dualism, the circulation of the blood. All these anatom basic anatomical advances were made. Um, and then the beginnings of theories of modern theories of, of mind-body dualism. So you can think of the modern era of neuroscience then, you know, as philosophies and influence on brain science wanes away. What have we discovered in the last 200 years? Well, we've covered a bit of this in the course. Um, we started labelling different brain areas. And then in the uh, 1800s, we started realising that nerves conducted electricity we started doing detailed neuropsychology of the brain, so we discovered patients with brain damage who have particular functional disorders. We started mapping the brains in dogs and monkeys at first, and then in humans. About a hundred years ago, there was a debate about was the brain composed of individual cells, like neurons, or was the brain rather sort of a continuous network, like a mesh or a net um, and that debate was, was, was completed a hundred years ago, approximately, and the neuron theory won out because they discovered the synapse, you know, connections between neurons. So neurons were distinct. And then from 1900 onwards, and Ivan Pavlov's work, you've got work on the reflexes and behaviorism, um, neurotransmitters, the chemicals that, that connect up different parts of brain, different cells, different 
synapses. Quite early on in the 20th century, electroencephalography was uh, invented. That's recording electrical signals from the scalp of, of humans, but also in general, the action potential. So the fact that nerves conducted electricity and how that came about, that was only discovered in the uh, 30s and 40s and 50s of the last century. Now in the 50s, 60s and 70s, we're talking about learning and memory, so discovering patients who, who lose their memory after a lesion, and also the mechanism, the cellular mechanisms of, of how information is stored over time, learning and memory. Then in the last 30 or 40 years, you've got all the different advances in brain imaging from PET to MEG to TMS and MRI. And these are different magnetic and nuclear um, methods of recording and stimulating the brain. So just on these lists of words, it looks like we've made an enormous progress in the last 200 years. But of course, whenever we look back over history, it always seems like the most recent period has been the most productive. Like we've, we've learned so much more in the last 200 years than the last 2000. Um, and that could just be because that's the paradigm that we're in. That's the thing, the stuff that we're looking back over is the stuff that's most similar to us. What makes sense to us now is the thing that happened most recently. So it seems like we've made massive progress in understanding the brain in the last 200 years, and maybe even in the last 10 years, last 20 years. I think if you look at the history of neuroscience and the history of philosophy of science and psychology as well, you see sort of analogies and uh, correlations between the kinds of concepts that are generally around in society and technology and the kind of concepts that you find in neuroscience and psychology. So let's go back to Freud, because you know I love Freud. Um, so Freud was working in the age of steam, you know, the, the steam engine people got around by powered by steam. It was before the invention of the um, petrol engine. Freud thought about the, the dynamic pressures and forces working in the subconscious mind. And so you could think of that as an analogy, you know, you look, looking at the technology that, that was around him that was available. You say, well, there's probably some sort of high pressure function going on under the, underneath the hood of the, of the brain. And so Freud was like a steam age technology. Then around the turn of the century, about the same time as Freud as well, there were the various behave, behaviorisms developed alongside ideas about reflexes in neuroscience. Uh, and so you could think of a reflexive sort of automatic stimulus response psychology and philosophy and also in neuroscience. And then around the 40s and 50s, the, the great development in com computers and information theory also led to developments in functionalism and philosophy, in modularity and cognitive psychology. And then sometime in the last 30, 40 years, we've had quantum physics has emerged in physics. And this has led to a number of conceptual problems about how to imagine and conceive of the physical world. And and some people have taken the inspiration from quantum physics to have a resurgence of this panpsychism as a theory of the mind. So all throughout this time, you can't really separate the ideas about the brain and the mind and the relationship between them from the technology and the other concepts that were around at the time. At least that's my, that's my view. And so on these metaphors for the mind, we might have to rely on future technology to provide new metaphors for us to understand the mind and the brain. So it's very possible that quantum physics, when we understand it, because it's pretty strange, will lead to a quantum theory of the mind. And actually, Roger Penrose, who, who got the Nobel Prize a couple of weeks ago for physics, he, he's actually already come up with a, a quantum theory of consciousness. It's a bit nuts, so we haven't covered it, but it's out there. So the possibility I want to raise here is that a future physics or maybe a future chemistry or a future biology may just explain away the mind-body problem in a way that we, we can't even imagine at the moment. And this is what an eliminative materialist might say. On this progress, however, it's unlikely to happen anytime soon. So there's a joke in the vision sciences community that... Um, human-like computer vision is only 20 years away, you know, a little bit more research and, and we'll be there, we'll, we'll, we'll produce a computer vision that can see and act just like a human can. 
And the joke is that this has always been said, whether it's 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, and so on. And even though computer vision is so far advanced from where it was in the 1950s, we're still 20 years away from a really genuine human-like computer vision. And a similar story in the field of brain neurophysiology. The cerebellum is the largest brain area. It contains about 70% of all of your neurons. And it's also one of the simplest brain areas because it only contains six different neuron types. And so a lot of neuroanatomists and physiologists have tried to understand the cerebellum. It's a bit like a sort of central processing unit of a computer. And the joke in that community is to ask, what does the cerebellum do? And that's like a title of people's talks and, and papers and chapters over the years. And they've been asking this question for decades and decades. And you can just create a new paper by saying, what does the cerebellum really do? Or what does the cerebellum do now? So we've been asking the same question about the largest and the simplest brain area for many decades. But I'd hate to leave you with reasons for pessimism. So what about optimism? What kind of things can we progress on in neuroscience? So 100 years ago, we just about discovered the neuron, but we didn't have an idea about the action potential, about how the neuron actually communicated. But now we do. And 50 years ago, we developed a method for scanning the electrical signals from the scalp in humans, but we couldn't go deeper. But now we can with MRI. And looking at spatial memory and spatial navigation, 20 years ago we discovered place cells in the hippocampus. These are special cells that seem to react when you're, whenever you're in a particular place in your environment. But in, only in the last 10 years have we discovered grid cells, which is another related kind of cell. So although some questions will take many, many decades or hundreds or thousands of years to answer, there is real progress. We know a lot more than we used to know. So I would just advise you, if you're worried about the mind-brain problem, just be patient. <laughs>